I've always had a passion for being around and learning about animals. When I was younger, going to zoos and animal parks was always a part of my life. I wanted to share my passion with family and friends, so I started working with people that loved animals as much as I did, and my YouTube channel was born. It is a nice fall day here in November at the St. Louis Zoo. I'm here to talk with Mike Dawson about animal artifacts, more specifically, mammal skulls. So, I hope you enjoy. Welcome back to my animal education series. Today, I'm with Mike Dawson at the St. Louis Zoo. Hello. Nice, nice to meet you. So, where are we right now? We are in classroom two of the living world. This is one of the St. Louis Zoo's education classrooms, and this is where we house the majority of our mammal biofacts. And how big is the St. Louis Zoo's collection? The collection is pretty big. It, uh, first, it dates back to about 1934, so we've been collecting items for quite a long time. Um, we have about 2,000 plus items wow. in several different locations across the zoo, and this is just one of those locations. And looking around, there is a lot of stuff in here. There are. We, we use this quite a bit for different teaching purposes, so for classes from kindergarten all the way up to college level classes and labs and stuff like that. It's a very useful collection. So, what are the important characteristics about like, these skulls here? These skulls? Well, when you look at a skull, one of the most important things to take a look at are any of the, the holes in the skull, um, any of the things that are sticking up, like a sagittal crest um, or a, a septical crest or zygomatic arches. And the reason is that's where muscles are attached. And so, looking at just the anatomy or morphology of a skull gives you an idea a lot of times about how it eats. Um, and plus, you can look at the teeth, it tells you a lot more about what it eats. And what skulls are these? So these are two related skulls, believe it or not. This is a giraffe skull right here, and this is an okapi skull. So they're in the same, same family group. Um, one's just a different species. This is one we do have here at the zoo. A little lesser known, a little bit shorter than a giraffe, um, but does have a, a longer neck like a, like a giraffe. Um, and if you look at the skull morphology, you can tell that they are very similar um, in, in, in the adaptations. Definitely have seen from the outside, and when I was younger, I never would have thought they were related. But definitely seeing the skulls now, with the, the nose and um, what are these called? These are <coughs> these are horns. Hmm. I thought there was like some special scientific. There is a scientific name, and I can't think of it right now. Okay, but seeing these, like, you can definitely tell they're related. That's correct. If you were to look at the skin pattern or something like that, they don't quite look related, but if you look at the morphology of the skull, you can definitely see the relatedness. And what do we have here behind us? So this is an elephant skull. So this is one that we've had here a long, long time ago. This is actually an African elephant skull. So ours right now at the zoo are Asian elephants. Um, you can usually tell the difference, actually, believe it or not, by the uh, teeth cusp pattern. Um, is how you tell the difference between an African and an Asian elephant, just, just by looking at teeth. Um, and then moving on here, this is just uh, some of the cabinets are open to show some of our different skulls uh, that we might utilize here from different types of hoofstock to pigs. Um, over in here we have primates and some of the bears and things like that. So you have a very wide collection. Yeah, and it makes it, makes it easy for teaching. If you're going to show different groups and compare groups and stuff like that, we have a pretty, pretty good collection. And are most of these... Uh, skulls and bones replicas or actually uh, most of them are, are real ones we do of course have replicas and for different purposes sometimes we may not have the species and so we may have a replica for that purpose sometimes some of our skulls are rare so we may use a replica especially if they get used over and over again um, and we put the uh, the real ones down in a different room on reserve and what is this skull here? This one is one of our rhinos from the past. This is an Indian rhino um, but it gives you a good idea of the anatomy uh, of what a rhino skull would look like um, you can definitely take a look at the teeth and the teeth pattern. Um, this is where the horn would grow from. And maybe go look at a horn? Yeah, let's go look at a horn. So right behind us, we'll come over here and take a look. So if you come over here, this is uh, a rhino horn here. Um, and it gives you a good idea. A lot of times you don't get the chance to look at it up close on a live rhino. But if you take a look and inspect it, what you can find is that this looks it's just hair. like hair. And it is. It's just keratin. So if you think of a rhino horn, it's basically a lot of compressed hair or keratin. Uh, with oil on it and it compresses really hard and so it's not much different um, than hair or fingernail if you think of it that way. And this is a very heavy fingernail. It's a very heavy, it's like a 30 pound fingernail on your head, yes, um, which is a neat adaptation for multiple reasons. Um, a lot of, of course, males have the, the bigger horns and stuff like that and they use it for reproduction purposes, tracking females and also defending off or at least uh, competing against other males. And you are talking about some of the other important characteristics of skulls for the teeth. Yeah, so if you were to take any skull, um, one of the first things I do for identification purposes um, is I usually take a look at the teeth first. And if you look at the teeth, they tell you a lot of different things. This is a tiger skull. 
And the first thing you can look at, if you look at your different kinds of teeth, so if you look up here, your incisors, your canines, and your molars, if you look at the shape of them, they tell you a lot about it. So most Very cats, pointed. yeah, and most cats, um, their molars are, are either, they, they don't have that many, and this one only has, functioning wise, about three. Um, but if you were to look at a, a tiger, you're gonna look at, they have carnassals. So it's a molar that's adapted for a point. And the reason why, and I can flip it upside down, if you were to articulate the bottom jaw, what you'll see is that the teeth are like scissors. So if you were to close it, you can tell that it cuts just like a pair of scissors like that. And so when this guy eats his meat, they use the canines usually to grab the animal behind the neck. Um, and if you take a look at that, once they tear off a piece of meat, they slide it in the back and, and swallow it. So similar to a house cat or a dog or some kind of carnivore like that, where they don't really chew their food, they just swallow their food. And maybe you can see some uh, herbivores. Maybe they both yeah, let's go grab a herbivore skull. Let's take a look at, uh, we'll grab one out of the cabinet, so something a little different. So if you were to, we'll grab an elk skull down here. If you were to take a look at an elk skull, this is a great example of a herbivore. So if you look at the eye placement, it's also a little different. So most herbivores have their eyes on the side versus a carnivore that has their eyes forward facing. And that's mainly because carnivores need depth perception. So having the eyes in front helps you um, have better depth perception. I'm, I'm assuming you played ball before. Mm -hmm. So I had a cat named Winky, and my cat had, was born with one eye, and my cat had a hard time with depth perception. So it'd have to take its one eye and go like that. Now if you have two eyes that are functioning, you don't need to do that, and you can chase the prey down. This animal is not worried about that because what it eats doesn't run away. Mm -hmm. But what it is worried about is somebody sneaking up on him, and so having him on the side gives him a better field of depth, or at least a viewer on the side of his body, so he's well protected while he's eating. And that's a good indication of an animal that is a herbivore. What do you think is your favorite skull, at least in this room? My room? Um, let's take a peek over here. My favorite skull probably would be down here. We have some rare skulls mixed in and out of the collection over the time this collection was put together. But this one I've always been fascinated with. Because you don't see it very often. Can you guess what it is? I cannot. Uh, it's very strange looking. It, it is. And, and this one's kind of unique because if you look at it, you're also, it's out of context because you're missing some of the parts. One of them would be this part, which would be made of cartilage. This is the bill of a duckbill um, platypus. Really? So if you take a look, this has been glued together, unfortunately. But if you open it up, they have molars back here. But they do have a bill in the front. Um, but pretty unique. You don't see a skull like this too often in collections. Um, so, and we don't have platypuses here, and we can't get them a, in the United States, so it's just need to see one up close. Yeah, it really is. It's very yeah. odd shape. Yeah, it looks like a, yeah, something like an insect here, pincher, or yes. something like that. So, kind of, kind of unique, but that's, I like some of the different skulls you don't get to see very often. So you touched on the vision with the elk over there, so what's the difference between this tiger skull and the elk vision-wise? Sure, Cole. So if you take a look at uh, the tiger skull right here, um, the first thing you notice is, like I mentioned over there, if you're a carnivore, you're typically your eyes are facing forward and that gives you the binocular vision. Once they have the best binocular vision, the closer the eyes are. Um, some of them, um, carnivores, you'll see if they go out, their binocular vision is still pretty good, but the closer they are, that's why these guys usually have a muzzle that comes out this way, keeps their eyes close together. You can also tell by the size of the orbit, so this is where the eyes are. This gives you an idea of the large eyes. This guy is probably nocturnal. And so it's sometimes the size of the eye orbit can, can determine the size of the eye itself. It gives you an idea. The other thing you can take a look on if you're a carnivore, you're also going to have to have a good sense of smell. Mm -hmm. And so if you take a look at this, this is the opening where the nasal cavity is. There's large bones in there. They're usually breakable. They're called turbinate bones. And you're, you basically have uh, tissues or cells that are sensitive to different smells. And they're, they grow, they're up and down uh, all over inside the turbinate bones. So when scent goes in there, they stick to it, sends a message to your brain. If you take a look, here's the brain way back here. So from this far up, that's the nasal cavity. Wow. So you can tell surface area inside there, it's huge. And so this guy has a great sense of smell. Same with anything like bears and dogs. If you go from the front up to where the brain starts, you're gonna have a massive area, surface area. And on this gorilla skull, it doesn't look nearly as big as the tiger. No, no, and definitely not. And so if you were to look at his nasal cavity, well, it's this big. And so it's a tiny little area. He still has a good sense of smell for us, um, but definitely not as good as something like, like this. Uh, but what you can tell by looking at something like this is a lot of times where the bite force might be and how strong it is. Uh, well, if you take a look at uh, gorillas and you watch some of ours, we eat a lot of vegetation. So versus if you were to look at a chimp or something like that, these guys eat a massive amount and their, and their stomach intestines is different than, than other, other primates or great apes. 
But if you were to look at the skull, it tells me a lot about this animal. So there, there always is a reason why there's bone protrusions and things like that. And this guy has one for a good reason. This one's a male, and so his head's going to look bigger. But this guy also has muscle that will grow from here down to here. So they can pull this upper jaw. And what this guy can do with this extra power is it's like a fulcrum. They can put a lot of power right between these two canine teeth, and they can crush a piece of bamboo or a big thick piece of grass or something like that, a reed. And then they can masticate it, which means they can mush it back and forth with these teeth. So that's one of the reasons why these guys have these big sagittal crests. A lot of times it tells you that they have a really strong bite force. Sometimes for meat, but in this case this is for crushing vegetation. Which isn't much different than if you were to jump over to a panda bear. A panda bear, though they evolve from other bears, which are typically omnivores. Um, if you were to pull this guy over here, once again, here's a very large sagittal crest. Mm, it looks like a lot of muscle. Yeah, correct. You have a, just a massive muscle that comes down, big zygomatic arches, but kind of a small little muscle, almost like this guy. It's like a nutcracker, and once again, he can put that pressure right there between those teeth and crack it. And if you look at his teeth, very similar, a lot of big flat molars, a lot of cusp, and that's for basically going up and down and masticating or, or breaking down um, a lot of the different vegetation that he eats. I'll leave that out so you can kind of, kind of see that. So once again, we'll take that same idea, but let's look at a carnivore. So if you were to look at, here's two different ones. This one is a dog right here on the left. And on the right right here, this is an African painted dog. And if you take a look right here, one of the things you'll notice is the zygomatic arches are much wider than this guy's. The shape of the, uh, the front is a little bit wider. But what this one is able to do that a dog, even probably your largest dogs, cannot do, these guys, and I don't have the lower, the lower jaw to show you, but these guys have enough power in their bite um, to actually crush bones in the back of their teeth. And so when these guys um, eat their food, they can eat the entire prey. And so they've evolved on an African plain where they're competing against a lot of other carnivores. So these guys live in large groups, sometimes with 20 to 30 individuals in a group. And when they eat food, they eat it all. So they eat it very fast and they don't have to crush it because they don't always have time to drag it somewhere and eat it. Or they could have competition pretty quickly. They have to eat their food you know, pretty fast or another animal will show up. Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons why they evolved something like that, which is pretty unique. Um, definitely a sagittal crest right here and big zygomatic arches is what's going to aid these guys in that power for crushing. I mean, you definitely don't, definitely don't see that in the domestic dog over here. Correct. They're adapted to yeah. like Still, e still doesn't mean they can't. They, they can bite hard, but yes, yes. they're going to have a hard time. Not nearly as hard as, let's say, a panda bear, a tiger. And a exactly correct. And they're just not going to have that power that they need to, to. They can probably break rabbit bones and things, softer bones, but nothing um, as hard as what this guy can eat. Mm, like a zebra or something yeah. like that. I'm trying to think uh, the biggest they could. Yeah, they can crush a lot of those, uh, those types mm -hmm. of hoofstock or smaller animals like that. They can eat as Pretty much anything that you have. Yeah, one of those out. zebra and horse bones over here. Yes, right? we do. Yeah, if you want to take a look at that. One of the neatest things that we like to talk about it for teaching purposes is comparison. So taking things that might be related and comparing them where they might be. This bone is called a cannon bone. And to be honest, it took me a long time reading about this, trying to understand it, what it represents. So I have actually the finger bones, the hand bones of a human. So if you take a look at this, this actually is from a leg bone of the zebra. And if you look right here, this bone which is one of your part of your digits, so the middle finger. This is the same bone right here. So what's happened over time, I'll flip this over. Right now, this is part of the other digits. So these would be these two bones here have now shrunken down and they have fused to this bone and it reinforces and makes it really strong. These bones right here are gonna be right up in here and these become the knee bone of a horse, which is kind of neat. The rest of the finger bone right here, they're down this direction, they become the end of the hoof, the part that bends like that. So they've evolved over time um, to, to lose or limit some of the different digits. And this has become a strong way for these guys to run. And so it's kind of neat when you compare them. If you were to compare this large bone, what do you think that is? I want to say an elephant because yeah. it's really big. Yes, that's correct. It is really big. And this is, this is your femur bone. So it's the same bone that would be from your hip down to your knee. Um, it just happens to actually it's pretty similar shape to our femur bone. It just happens to be from a very large animal, which is an elephant. So comparing wise, you can definitely get an idea of things that are very similar, things that have changed over time in different groups and how they've evolved. It's pretty crazy how all um, those wild dogs can bite through this for food. It, it is amazing that they can crush. And I'm sure there's some bones they can't crush, but it is amazing there's enough power oh, to chip it. Very in. heavy. Yeah, they can chip, um, break it open and get the marrow out of some of these different animals. In this video clip, you can see some of the St. Louis Zoo's flesh-eating beetles. To start this process, you first have to remove as much flesh as possible. Then, you place it in with the beetles. Once defleshed, you can soak the bones in peroxide for a period of time. After that, you rinse and dry the bones and apply a sealant. Once that's been completed,
the curators catalog, tag, and add the bones to their collection. And I'd like to thank Mike Dawson and the St. Louis Zoo for allowing me to come out here and do interviews. And I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode. And as always, don't forget to leave a big thumbs up down below, subscribe to my channel, and also check out my Instagram, at Cole Shirk. As always, I'll see you next week.